guys, my name is Ashton. Um, I decided to do my presentation over fashion law. If you guys have any questions, there's my email down below. Feel free to send me an email. Um, I wanted to start off fashion law by giving a brief history because when relative to other legal fields, this is relatively new. Um, in history, there weren't really any laws set in place anywhere near like today, but everyone typically followed a general set of understood ideals such as who wears what, um, don't steal from another person. But in 2000, L'Adroit International de la Mode, excuse my poor pronunciation, was published, and this was a thesis that outlined general ideas that could be brought into the legal field. Um, this didn't really get much representation, so fashion law was truly conceptualized after an article entitled Droit du Luxe was published in a popular magazine. Um, it laid the foundation for creating a legal fashion field, and it's usually referred to in European countries as the law of luxury goods. So following this, in 2006, Manhattan had Fordham Law School offering its first fashion course. And then in 2010, also in New York, the Fashion Law Institute was established. So I wanna continue this presentation on by talking about intellectual property. Um, so intellectual property, I'm gonna define it as property rights that are covering creative work, ideas, and inventions. So as that relates to the fashion field, you have your product designs, if you have a brand logo you love, or modeling photos. Um, the intent of it is to basically um, keep the consumers knowing exactly where their products have originated from. This also includes the scope of copyright protection. Um, it also includes dealing with counterfeit goods, such as the Gucci in this picture. Um, technology utility patents, so if, if you have a certain way, a certain type of technology you like to use to create your products, you can patent that. Um, and then very recently it included the cultural appropriation and use of religious cultural symbolism, so dealing with that as well. Um, and I wanted to bring up a case, um, Star Athletica versus Varsity Brands. Um, Varsity Brands is basically a brand that um, designs cheerleading costumes. They design other things, but I'm not too familiar with them. Um, but Varsity Brands sued Star Athletica for using their cheerleading uniform designs. Um, Star Athletica basically argued that the designs didn't hold up under copyright law, but the court said um, in a 6-2 in favor of Varsity Brands that since the article of stripes would be copyrightable if it was presented as a standalone piece of art, it should also be copyrightable on this useful article of clothing. So following that, I wanted to talk about manufacturing and the ethics and sustainability of fashion law. This includes worker safety and labor practices and also knowing exactly the source from where your items are coming from. So going back to this labor practices, um, I wanted to bring up the case of Nike versus Kasky. So a California resident, um, his name was Mark Kasky, claimed that Nike omitted facts concerning working conditions for those who produced Nike products. Um, so Nike argued that their speech was protected under the First Amendment, um, and this was kind of a controversial one. So um, I learned what a per curiam opinion was, um, and excuse me if I kind of get it a little bit wrong, but basically as I have researched it, um, I believe it is meaning that when they come forth all together, um, every justice comes forth, but they basically, no one has their name stamped on this decision. So, um, for example, for this one, they all came forth together and said that the California Supreme Court believed that even though Nike's speech was obvious commercial speech, the question of if their speech was inaccurate needs to be addressed before they can come to a conclusion. So this continues on with the idea of greenwashing, which is basically making your products sound more environmentally friendly than they may be. Um, you have to meet the certification standards of clothing items or cosmetic items. You have to deal with the regulation of digitally altered advertisements and how they affect the consumers, um, as well as the ethics of donation products. So like buying a sweater and then giving one to a homeless shelter. So on top of that, we also deal with marketing. Um, as far as this is concerned, you have to worry a lot about labeling requirements. So whenever you're releasing new clothes, you need to make sure that you're letting people know what fibers are in it, how much there are, um, the country that it was made in, the manufacturer. Um, you wanna make sure to have the proper licensing for those products. And you can deal with a lot of things like L'Oreal. Basically, they did a lot with deceptive advertisement. 
So the FTC basically barred them from advertising without proper scientific data because they were doing it so often. So um, in this specific youth code advertisement, they basically said that due to their, quote, gene science, um, you could achieve visibly younger skin in seven days, which was absolutely no evidence to that. So continuing on, I was really interested in this part. Um, so I wanted to talk about the retail of law. So um, you'll have to deal with, of course, the real estate leasing and ownership and things like that. Um, you're also going to have to deal with in-store and online, the consumer data privacy. So as far as like possible leakages. Um, and then recently, um, you also have to deal with handling racial discrimination when it comes to retail as well. So I wanted to continue by talking about the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission versus Abercrombie and Fitch. So a Muslim woman named Samantha Eloff, also sorry for my pronunciation on that one, um, applied in an Abercrombie and Fitch store. She wore her hijab daily, and although she didn't specifically express that she needed an accommodation from their look policy, she wasn't hired because she wasn't willing to take off her hijab for work. So the question is, can an employer be held liable under the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for refusing to hire an applicant based on a religious observance? Um, their reasoning for being in favor of the EEOC is that an applicant only needs to show that the need for accommodation was a motivating factor in the employer's decision, not that the employer had knowledge of the need. And then following that, here are my references, and basically I'll go back real fast just to show you guys my email one more time if you have any questions. Um, okay, have a good day, guys.